So here's the question for today. How can I be sure that what I'm holding in my hand right now is what was written all the way back then? You may have been told that this Bible has gone through so many changes and additions and revisions and translations that you can't really trust what you read today. So how do you know that when you read about Jesus' miracles and about his resurrection, that that was actually put in by people who were eyewitnesses to those things rather than added hundreds of years later. How can we be comfortable and know that the teaching we read about today even remotely resembles what Jesus said 2,000 years ago? You've probably all played the telephone game. Who else played the, the telephone game? Yeah, so you get in this circle, big circle, and somebody whispers a message to the person next to them, then that person whispers it to the next person, and then it goes around the circle. And what you find is that by the time it gets around that big circle, the ending message isn't nearly the same as the beginning message. I'm about to make an announcement that excites me. We may have to scoot in a little bit and move around. We've got people still coming in, and we may not have enough seats in here. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> but... All right, get back to my sermon. So just be aware of that and let people uh, slide in if they need to. Um, so how can we know that the Bible is not some big game of telephone where you may have heard that it was oral retelling for centuries. And so one generation would tell the stories to the next generation. And with each retelling, it got more fanciful and outrageous so that by the time it was finally written down, it looked very different than what actually happened. Some of you may even be, have heard that Jesus never really claimed to be divine, that the early church didn't even worship him as divine, but those parts of the Bible were added later by either Emperor Constantine in the 4th century or even by King James of England in the 17th centuries. And, and so the attack has been coming from historians, but even more from that, it's coming from modern culture. And here's the attack. Look, you can trust parts of the Bible. You can get some encouragement from the Bible. You can maybe find out ways to live a good life and treat other people well, but you can't really trust the deeper truths in the Bible. One example of this attack is from a series of popular fiction books by the author Dan Brown. The, the first of those books that have been made into movies was The Da Vinci Code. How many of you have read or seen the movie? Yeah, I have. It's a good book but it's a work of fiction that goes out of its way to challenge the deity of Jesus, but also the historical accuracy of the Bible. And in the first book, The Da Vinci Code, there's this quote from one of the main characters in the book that kind of sums up this attack. Here is this quote. The Bible did not arrive by facts from heaven. The Bible is the product of man, my dear, not of God. The Bible did not fall magically from the clouds. Man created it as a historical record of tumultuous times, and it has evolved through countless translations, additions, and revisions. History has never had a definitive version of this book. And, and so people hear these kinds of things from a teacher or a professor, or someone that plays a teacher or professor in a movie, and their faith is affected. I've actually read that based on this work of fiction by Dan Brown, a lot of Christians left their faith because they didn't feel like they could trust who Jesus was. And, and what's amazing is that's a, that the Da Vinci Code is a fiction book. But that fiction book convinced people that this is a work of fiction. And so it brings us to our question today, can we really trust the Bible? And, and this sermon's going to feel a little different than most. There's a lot of teaching in this, a lot of historical data. And so I want to tell you that it's, it feels a little different. It's taken me longer to write this sermon than it does most. And I've used some sources outside the Bible, and I want to give credit to those sources. It includes some research by a guy named Dr. Daniel Wallace from the Dallas Theological Seminary. He is also the executive director of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. It sounds very serious. Um, I've also used some information from Lee Strobel in his book, The Case for Christ. And I've also included some material from a good sermon on this topic by Pastor Ben Stewart. But to answer this big question, can we really trust the Bible? We really have to ask a series of more specific questions to get to that answer. And here's the first question we have to answer, ask. Do we still have the original writings from the New Testament? And the short answer to that is no, we don't. What we have are copies, and here's how that works. The original writings, those 27 books of the New Testament, were written on papyrus paper. And papyrus paper is made by taking papyrus reeds and mashing them together and making paper so it has the consistency of roughly like a 
paper grocery sack. And as you might imagine, over time, that wears down and breaks down. These letters were passed around by the early church. And over probably about 100 years, they would have disintegrated and not been there anymore. There's actually only about three places in the world where papyrus paper holds up for more than about 100 years, and that's places with really dry and arid environments. So these original writings by people like Peter and the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John have, have no longer exist. What we have remaining today are handwritten ancient copies of those original writings. And that brings us then to the second specific question we have to answer. How many handwritten copies still exist of the New Testament? The short answer to that is a lot. So in the original Greek language, people started to copy, handwrite those original manuscripts. And so in the original Greek language, we have about 5,800 handwritten copies. Now, they're not all complete copies of the New Testament. Sometimes they would copy a part of the New Testament or even a single book or even on occasion a part of a book for a particular purpose. But they're also not short. The average length of those Greek copies is about 450 pages long. But we have 5,800 of those still in existence. And then in the second century, Rome began to translate the New Testament from the original Greek into Latin. And we have about 10,000 Latin copies uh, in the Latin language that still exist today from starting in the second century. And then we have about another 10,000 copies of ancient manuscripts of the New Testament or parts of the New Testament in, lang in other languages. So somebody might want one, Coptic was a language that a number were translated in to send to different places. So the total we have of copies of significant parts of the New Testament is about 25,000 different copies that still exist. Now, if that's not enough for you to go read this afternoon, there's also a lot of quotations of the New Testament by early church leaders. An example of this is a dude named Ignatius quotes parts of the book of Matthew in AD 107. And so we still have some of his work, and it quotes this about 75 years after Jesus rose from the dead. Some dudes have gone back and counted all the times that the New Testament has been quoted by early church leaders these are guys that need a hobby, clearly. But they've gone back through all of that, and they found that it's been quoted by early church leaders over a million times. That's a lot of information that we have. We can look at what we have today, and we can go back and look at ancient documents to compare and make sure that what we're reading today is accurate. But you may be sitting there going, ah, you know, but is 25,000 copies that much? Well, let's compare it to five other important historical documents that exist. There are five historians that pretty much tell us everything we know about ancient Rome and ancient Greece. So let's start. For ancient Rome, there's three historians from the first century called, one's named Livy, and then Tacitus, and Suetonius. For Livy, we don't have the original writings, we just have 27 copies that still exist that were handwritten. For Tacitus, there's only three copies that are ancient handwritten copies. And the earliest copy we have for him is 800 years after he wrote his original history. The surviving copies of Suetonius is, is a number. We have a number of those. But all of those start about 800 years after he did his historical work. So then most of what we know about ancient Greece comes from two Greek historians from the 5th century BC, guys named Thucydides and Herodotus. We only have little tiny slivers of documents that have copied theirs from the first century AD, which is about 600 years after they wrote their works. We have little tiny slivers. And then it's several hundred years more before we have complete handwritten copies of their works. Now, we don't look at those little limited information that's you know, long after they died that was copies. We don't look at that and go, can we... Can we really know if ancient Rome existed? Can we, can we really know about Greek culture? How do we know those things? Because we don't have the original writings. No, we trust that there's been some accuracy in the copying process as they hand wrote those documents over and over. But let's talk about how those five historians' writings and the, the copies of those stack up against the New Testament. If we took all of the copies, the ancient copies of those five historians, there's less than 400 total copies, and the nearest to the date it was written is about 300 years. That's the closest in time one of those copies was made to when the original work was performed. 
For the New Testament, we have 25,000 handwritten copies. Some of those existing copies are less than 100 years after the original writing. So if we were to stack all of those ancient historians' copies, if we were to stack that up on the stage, it'd go 13 feet into the air, which sounds pretty impressive. But if we took those 25,000 copies of the New Testament and we stacked them up, it would go a mile, just to give you some perspective on how much historical data we have to look at the history of the Bible. Let me show you a picture of an existing manuscript fragment from the New Testament. This is called P52 or Papyrus 52. So it was written on papyrus paper. Uh, this is the oldest copy, and it's dated between 60 and 100 years after Jesus' death. So very close in time to all of that. There's writing on both sides so that you're not looking at two different fragments. You're looking at one fragment. It's just two-sided so that we put it both up there. What you're looking at is writings from the book of John about when Jesus was tried by Pilate just before he went to the cross. And the front side of that has a quote from John 18, 31 through 33. And Pilate here is talking to the Jewish leaders, and this is what he says. Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And they said, but we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, are you king of the Jews? Now, what I love, though, is the backside of that. If we have the backside, it's from a different passage right there close by. Uh, it's actually John 18, 37 through 30, 38. It says, you're a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again and said to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Don't you love that the oldest existing copy, the little sliver we have, talks about the truth that Jesus brought? Because that's what we're trying to find out today as modern Christians is, can we believe the truth of this document? And that manuscript, P52, that has that language, dates from between 60 and 100 years after Jesus rose from the dead. But what does that mean? That means that the original was before that. That means that the Apostle John, who was Jesus' best friend, wrote his original story less time than that because it had to be copied. And, and what we know is that the Apostle Paul wrote some of his original letters just 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead. So there were still lots of eyewitnesses alive who knew what had happened. So we have a ton of copies. Um, and so the next question we have to answer is, how consistent are the remaining copies of the New Testament? You may have heard that when you take all those 25,000 copies and you put them up against each other, that there are differences in the copies. And those are called variances. And, and pure number, there are a lot of variances. And so uh, people that want to challenge the New Testament, <coughs> they talk about the number of variances between the different copies. And like I said, there's a lot. But the question is, not just how many there are, but are they significant? The reality is the vast majority of those differences between those copies comes down to spelling. It's just spelling differences between the different copies. And most of that is not even spelling mistakes. It's different ways of spelling the same word. Let me give you an example that accounts for a whole lot of those variances. You can spell the New Testament name John, which was obviously John the Apostle. You can spell it in the Greek, with one new at the last, which is with N is the translation, so J-O-H new, or J-O-H new new, or J-O-H-N-N. So some people would spell it J-O-H-N, some people would spell it J-O-H-N-N, and every one of those times counts as a variance. So you think of all the different times that John is used in the New Testament, out of 25,000 different copies that have gone different directions, every one of those counts as a different variance. But, but let me give you the modern example, right? It, you can spell Carol, C-A-R-O-L, K-A-R-O-L, K-A-R-O-L-E, C-A-R-A-O-L-E. All those differences are still Carol, it's just different spellings. So the next time someone is talking to you about all the number of differences or variances in the New Testament, you can tell them that over 70% of those are simply spelling differences. Now, there's a lot of spelling differences because there's a lot of copies. We have all these massive copies that we can compare. And so those spelling differences add up. Another variance we get is the Greek language can be hard to translate certain words 
into Latin or other languages. Greek is a very precise language. So I'll give you an example. The English word love is a single word that we use a lot of different ways. I love God. I love my wife. I love bacon. Those are all different uses, but it's one word. In the ancient Greek, there are actually eight different words for different types of love. Three of those are used in the New Testament. And so when people be translating from Latin, they may pick a different translated word to get into Latin. And every one of those counts as a different variance. The last thing about the Greek language is in, in Greek, it doesn't matter what order the words in the sentence are in because it's the words themselves, the way they're written, that give you the meaning of the sentence. Other languages, like English, the order of words in a sentence matter dramatically for how the sentence is interpreted. So as Greek manuscripts were copied, sometimes they would move those words around because it didn't change the meaning. So I, I want to just think for just a second about 25,000 copies and some scribe sitting in a little room for weeks or months trying to do that precisely, one to the to the next. Those variances based on spelling and just those little things we just talked about is over 99% of the variances between the copies, 25,000 copies. But look at, I want to show you one picture. This is P66. It's another, we're going to talk a little more about it uh, later, but this is one of those ancient copies and you can see a, a fix, a correction where the scribe had made a mistake and because they couldn't erase, he just made the, the fix there on the, the document itself. And you can see that counts as a variance. That's something different in that manuscript than the others. But there are very, very few substantive differences between 25,000 texts. And the reality is we've already identified almost all of those and eliminated them by looking at different copies. But let me give you an example of one that's a substantive difference that we still haven't fully found out what's right. Let me show you that. It's a, it's a meaningful variation that's probably the most significant that still exists. This is Revelation 13, 18. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. So if you look back, some of the early ancient manuscripts don't have 666. That's going to disappoint some of you that have been looking for the, the number of the beast everywhere you look. The number they have is actually 616 which sounds more like an area code to me than the number of the beast. But so what historians have done and, and, and theological experts have looked at the vast majority use 666, not 616. So that's what's in your modern translation. But that admittedly is a substantive difference. And it's one of the biggest ones that still exist. But why is that important? Because none of our Christian doctrine or faith is based on that. We, we don't say, I believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe in the virgin birth, birth in the number 666. It doesn't affect us in any way. Even the harshest critics of New Testament historicity have to admit that there is no impact of these variances on the Christian doctrine that we study today. All right, here, here's another question that we have to address. Did the earliest manuscripts include scripture stating that Jesus is God? You may have heard from somebody or a teacher that said, you know, Jesus really never even claimed to be God. He, he said he was a good teacher and, you know, his, the early church didn't worship him as God. They thought he was a prophet, maybe he did some miracles, but they never thought that he was God in the flesh. And that it wasn't until actually Emperor Constantine of Rome in the third century became a Christian that those parts were added. And specifically, historians used to say that some of that language was added at something called the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Keep that year in mind because it's going to matter. But that criticism by some historians got absolutely blown out of the water when they found another ancient papyrus paper called P66 that we looked at briefly. If you want to see that original, we're going to show you a little piece of it right here. But you can see the whole thing if you want to fly to Geneva, Switzerland, it's there. It has much of the New Testament, including almost all of the book of John. That document, that copy, handwritten copy, has been dated back to A.D. 200. Why is that significant? Because that was, that was 100 years before Constantine even became emperor and 125 years before the Council of Nicaea. So what we're going to see is that long before Constantine was even born, there are copies that clearly talk about Jesus being God. Let's look at uh, a little part of that. John 1.1 that was contained in P66 
It says, in the beginning was the Word, it's talking about Jesus here, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you jump down about 14 verses and you get to verse 14, it says this, the Word became flesh, Jesus, in other words, he took on flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So a hundred years before Constantine was even born, the Bible clearly said that Jesus is God. And so you don't hear historians saying that Emperor Constantine added that language anymore because we know that's not true. Even the toughest critics of the New Testament have to admit that none of our doctrine is affected. We can have confidence that what we read now is what they wrote back then. We can have confidence in the New Testament. All right, we've talked about the New Testament, but I want to talk briefly about the Old Testament. How about the Old Testament? For a long time, the oldest manuscripts we had of the Old Testament were from 900 AD. Now, keep in mind that the last book of the Old Testament was probably written about 400 BC. So we got about 1,300 years from the last writing of the Old Testament to the oldest surviving copy. And so it was fair to say, that's a long time. That was 1,300 years between those two dates. And so those open to some criticism. But then back in 1947, there were some Bedouin goat herders that were out herding goats, and they were in the Dead Sea area. And I guess they, to entertain themselves, they were throwing rocks up into caves to see who could be the most accurate throwing rocks up into caves. I guess maybe goat herding isn't as exciting as it sounds. So they're sitting there throwing rocks into the caves, and one of them throws a rock, and hears something that sounds like a crash. So one of the young guys climbs up into the cave and discovers some clay pots. And one of those clay pots has an old scroll written on animal skin that they were still writing on it. And so they got excited. They showed some local scholars, and the local scholars looked at it and realized that it was the Old Testament book of Isaiah. So they sent this scroll to John Hopkins University to a guy named William Albright who tested it and found that these scrolls date back to 100 years before Jesus was born. So now we've gone back 1,000 years from what we had before, from 900 AD to 100 BC. Huge, because suddenly now that's not that far away from the original writings. So they go back into these caves and they search for the rest of it. And they find almost the entirety of the Old Testament that was all written before Jesus was born. That's a huge find. Now, why this happened is these were animal skins, not papyrus paper. That was an older form. And it was in a very unique place. This place where they were kept was below sea level. It was very arid and it was very salty. And so that allowed these animal skins to be preserved much longer than would typically happen. Almost like somebody thought about that, huh? But so... Before this discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we've got this big gap, but suddenly now we have a thousand year older copies that we can look at. That in it of itself is a big enough deal, but it also lets historians and theologians do a little telephone game and look and see what does a, a scroll that was written in 1 BC look like to scrolls that were written a thousand years later, and how close did they match up? How much telephone went on? And what they found was just like the New Testament, almost all of the variances were spelling and stylistic. What we read in the Bible today is what they wrote back then. God went out of his way to give us confidence in what is happening today. When author Lee Strobel was writing his book, The Case for Christ, he did an interview with this guy who's named Bruce Metzger. He's a doctor at the Princeton University Seminary. And Dr. Metzger has taught it at uh, Oxford University in England and Cambridge University. He's been a professor emeritus at Princeton for 40 years, and he has spent his entire professional life studying New Testament manuscripts for authenticity to make sure that what we read today is accurate. And you can go read The Case for Christ. It's a great book, and you can see this full interview as they talk about some of the facts that I've given you today. But I want to read from you uh, here in just a second a, a quote of this, of this interview, a little piece of it. Because what Dr. Metzger is saying is, all his research has shown us that we can have absolute confidence that what we're reading today is what they wrote back then. And, and so Lee Strobel asked him and says, okay, let me ask you a couple of questions. And I want to read that too. Here it is. This is Lee's question. All these decades of scholarship, of study, of writing textbooks, of delving into the musha of, of the New Testament, what has all this done to your personal faith? I ask. 
Oh, he sounded happy to discuss the topic. It has increased the basis of my personal faith to see the firmness with which these materials have come down to us, with multiplicities of copies, some of which are very, very ancient. So I started to say, scholarship hasn't diluted your faith? But he jumped in before I could finish my sentence. On the contrary, he stressed, it has built it. I've asked questions all my life. I've dug into the text. I've studied this thoroughly. And today I know with confidence that my trust in Jesus has been well placed. He paused while his eyes surveyed my face. And then he added for emphasis, very well placed. Here's the bottom line. What you have in this book is what was written back then. God has gone out of his way to supernaturally preserve the evidence so that we can have confidence in this book. Which brings up the the last and maybe the most important question. And that's this. Why was the Bible preserved in such a supernatural way? The answer is pretty easy. The answer is because God wanted us to have confidence in the truth of the Bible. But there's actually a bigger issue than that. God preserved it and gave us confidence so that we can meet the author of the book. He he wants to transform our lives through the story of Jesus. You can read about Jesus that's prophesied in the Old Testament, that we now have those historical documents that go all the way back into B.C. times. You can read about the life and the ministry of Jesus that has been so well preserved. We get to see this love story of God, how he loved you so much that he sent his only son to die on the cross so that you could be forgiven. It's awesome that one of those oldest manuscripts, P66, is, has a lot of the book of John. In fact, almost all of the book of John. And it talks about who Jesus is and his divinity. But I want to look back at what we looked at a minute ago, John 1.14, where it's this description. I think maybe the best description of the author of this book. The word or Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. That's what God wants us to know in the Bible. That's the author. That's who we're to get to know. If you don't know this word grace that's found there, the Greek word for grace is charis. So when we talk about charis city church, all we've done is take the Greek word for grace. It's actually pronounced charis, but because it sounds like you just coughed or had something caught in your throat, we Texanized it and made it charis. So we are grace city church, charis city church. And you find that Greek word all the way throughout the New Testament. It, you find it 100, over 135 times in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul uses that word grace or charis over 100 times, trying to explain to us what it is and how it applies to us. But here's something you may not have known. Jesus never used that word. Not even one time. Never mentioned the word grace in all his teaching. Instead, he lived a life that shows us what it looks like. And when you see all those stories, dozens of stories about Jesus, how he lived out grace, maybe you can start to realize that this greatness of grace is big enough to even cover you. And you can start to think that maybe, just maybe, this 2,000-year-old story can change your life today. I want to just tell you a couple of those stories. In in Mark chapter 1, we read about Jesus healing a man with leprosy. And the Bible says that he reached out and touched the man to heal him. And what's important to understand is Jesus didn't have to touch this man to heal him. Jesus healed lots of people that he didn't touch. In fact, he healed someone's servant, and he didn't go to the house where the servant was. Jesus didn't have to touch him, but he did. Here's why that's significant. Leprosy was a terrible disease, and it was thought to be very contagious. So no one would dare to touch a leper. In fact, you didn't want to be near lepers, and that's why you have leper colonies, and you hear about that. And so this man probably hadn't felt another human's touch in many, many years. And the Bible says that Jesus reached out his hand, and he touched him to heal him. In that power of healing, we get to see the glory and the majesty of Jesus. But it's in his touch that we get to see his grace. And we start to see the humanity and the beauty of Jesus' grace. There's another story that the Apostle John tells in John chapter 8 about Jesus walking up on some men getting ready to stone a lady who'd been caught in adultery. And Old Testament law was clear that stoning was an appropriate uh, punishment for uh, infidelity. 
There was no question the evidence was strong. She'd sinned against her husband. She'd sinned against God. And stoning was the appropriate punishment. But the Bible says Jesus sat there and he said, hey guys, you guys have every right to kill her. But but I have an idea for you. Maybe the one of you that's never sinned, maybe you ought to be the one to throw the first rock. And the Bible says that those men stood there and one by one they dropped their rocks and they walked away. After they'd all left, Jesus looked at the woman and he said, where's everybody gone? (laughs) Did no one stay to accuse you? Then neither do I. Can you imagine that moment for this lady? The the, the Apostle John doesn't tell us about her reaction, but I can just imagine that she would have had tears just streaming down her face, tears of joy and of sorrow. Time after time, we see Jesus live out grace so that we can understand what it is. Maybe the most grace he ever showed was when he was hanging from the cross, had seven inch nails piercing his hands and his feet. He was choking to death as he hung there. And he looked down at the people who had nailed in those nails and had put him on that cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's grace. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. And he looked down at those men and forgave them. That's grace. And when you see these stories of grace, over and over and over again in the New Testament from Jesus, you can begin to understand that maybe, maybe grace is big enough for my sin. See, no matter what you've done, no matter how bad you've messed up, how long you've been messing up, grace is greater than your sin. Grace is greater than your sin, not because of what you've done and how bad it is. Grace is greater because of what was done for you. Grace is greater than whatever it is you've done. Jesus paid a heavy price for you to get that grace. He went to the cross so that you could experience the grace of Jesus and so grace could be be greater. But but this perfect love that we read about from Jesus, uh, it's called agape love or agapao is the, the way that love is. And that's one of those Greek words that talks about love. That's the kind of love. It's God's love, perfect love. It wasn't just filled with grace, it says it was also filled with truth. I love how John describes that. He says that this love of Jesus, this personality of Jesus, this agapao, was filled with grace and truth. He doesn't put truth first, he puts grace first, because Jesus led with grace. But Jesus never shied away from truth. And you can't have real, perfect love without grace and truth. Jesus was never afraid to say hard truth, even when people didn't like it, even when they didn't want to hear it. When when we think about this story of the lady that was caught in adultery, Jesus actually showed grace and truth in that moment. We talked about the grace, but after all the accusers had left and he had said, I don't accuse you either. And he looked at the lady and he said, go and sin no more. There's the truth. You cannot understand the grace of Jesus with also understanding grace the truth of Jesus. They go hand in hand. That's that perfect love. And and I think if Jesus were to sit down over a cup of coffee with you, he'd do the same thing. He'd love you right where you are, but he'd also share truth. Maybe he'd say, pornography is destroying your marriage. You need to do something different. You're, You're having sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend because you want to feel needed and wanted and loved, but all you're feeling is guilt and shame. Maybe he'd say, alcohol tearing your family apart. Maybe you'd say your anger has gotten out of hand. It's, it's costing you a relationship with your kids or your parents or your siblings. Jesus loves you enough with perfect love that he would hug you and then he would tell you truth because that's who he is. That's what we see in Jesus. Look, I, I don't know your sin struggle. I don't know what you've done. I don't know where you are, but you do. And Jesus does. And I know some of you are here and you've got that secret sin that you work so hard to keep people from finding out about. And you think the worst thing that could ever happen is for you to be found out. But here's the thing. That's not the worst thing that could happen. The worst thing that could happen is for you to go all the way through this life and never experience God's love, His grace, and His truth. That's the worst thing that could happen. We want to be a church where we're transparent about our struggles because we want to feel this freedom and joy that Jesus offers us, this perfect love. 
the goal for the Bible that's been preserved so well for us today isn't this we get information. It's that we're transformed by the author of this book so that we're changed completely by his perfect love. And I want to show you a little illustration that I use a lot. So if you think I've seen that before, you have intentionally and you'll see it again. But it just illustrates the truth of why the Bible was preserved. Here's what it says. Information plus application equals transformation. In other words, we get this amazing truth from the Bible that's been preserved. We apply it into our life, and through that application, we're transformed. We're completely changed by the author. So what does that look like for you? If you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, what it looks like is you accept that perfect love. You, you claim it for yourself by following after Jesus. You believe that he is who he says he is and that he's done what he claims to have done. And then you're transformed by that. You repent of your sins. You make him Lord and Savior of your life. And then you mark that moment in baptism. I love that we've had baptisms over the last few weeks and we've got more today. We've got two after this service. We've got more scheduled for next week and we're still scheduling more after that. People have read this truth in the Bible about Jesus, and they're allowing that to transform their lives. But let me be clear. If you walk out of this service today and you reject Jesus, you decide not to follow him. And if you go all the way through this entire life, continuing to reject and denying Jesus for who he is, he won't love you any less. He, he loves you more than you can possibly imagine, and your rejection of him won't change that. But what a waste when the God of the universe wants a relationship with you for eternity to walk out on that and to reject that. Uh, look back at where this, another part of this P66 that's so well preserved. This part of John 1 that we've been looking at. This is verses 12 and 13. It's talking about what Jesus wants from us, how we can follow Jesus. Look at verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. That's the offer from this book. This is the offer from the author of this book. He wants to make you his children, adopt you into his family. That's what's out there for you. But ultimately, the decision of whether to accept that love is up to you. And for those of us who are already followers of Jesus, the challenge is a little different. The challenge is for us to take that agape, that perfect love, own it for ourselves, but then share it with everybody else. I want to show you what Jesus said about that again from the book of John. It's another place. John 15, 12, he's talking to his followers and he says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And the tough thing is the word love there is that same word in Greek, agapao, perfect love. It's telling us that we have to have the love of God for the people here, but also the people out there. And the challenge is this. It's, it's easy to love our family and friends, the people that are like us, but, it, but it's a whole lot more different to love the people who look different than us, who, who think different than us, who act different than us. The perfect love of Jesus displayed on the cross means we love even our enemies. There's an author that was trying to describe this, author Frederick Bucher in his book. He's trying to describe this perfect love of Christ. And here's what he says. The love for equals is a human thing, of friend for friend, brother for brother. It is a love, it's to love what's loving and lovely. And the world smiles. The love for the less fortunate is a beautiful thing. The love for those who suffer, for those who are poor, the sick, the failures, the unlovely. This is compassion and it touches the heart of the world. The love for the more fortunate is a rare thing, to love those who succeed where we fail, to rejoice without envy with those who rejoice, the love of the poor for the rich. The world is always bewildered by its saints. And then there's the love for the enemy, love for the one who doesn't love you, who mocks, threatens, and inflicts pain, the tortured's love for the torturer. This is God's love. This love conquers the world. That's the truth that the Bible went out of its way to preserve. All of that is summed up in this. God loves us passionately and he wants us to love the others around him, around us that are the same way. He wants us to show his love, to accept his love. That's 
what's preserved in this Bible. Let's pray.